document a drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law to an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, April 17th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner is Frank Smith. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 11.36 a.m. when we got to the Greenleaf Apartment Hotel. Apartment 406. Yes? Police officer's name. Oh, yes, come in. Thank you. This is my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. How do you do? How do you do, ma'am? I'm Lane Holt, and I'm the one who called you. Terrible thing, just terrible. Yes, Miss Holt. Murphy, just tell us what happened, if you could. Well, Georgia, she's a maid, huh? Georgia was cleaning up in here. She finished the apartment, and then she thought she'd check the coat closet right here. Mm-hmm. She opened the door, and there she was on the floor. Ma'am? Dead woman. You can see for yourself. She's right there on the floor. It's terrible. Georgia now, Mrs. Holden. She's downstairs in my place. She's pretty broken up. Must have been a terrible shock to her. She let out a scream that must have had half the neighborhood on edge. I live down on the second floor in the rear. I thought at first that something happened to Georgia. Oh, that girl's got a powerful set along. Yes, ma'am. Who rented this apartment from you? I need to ask that. I've got your seat book right here on my apron. Just a minute. All right. Put a pencil on the page. Let's see. Yes, there it is. Raymond Bartley. That's what he said. Bartley. You know where this Bartley is now? No, I don't. And that's another weird one. You know what I mean. Ma'am. Well, look in the closet. Look around the places. None of his clothes. Nothing will even tell you he was still here. He's got another week to go on his rent. Hmm. How's that, ma'am? Well, he moved in a week ago. You can see here on the receipt, Wednesday, April 9th. Mm-hmm. Paid him two weeks in advance. And you look around this place, and it don't look like he's going to be around here anymore. Do you have any idea where he might be? Oh, not the slightest. Did he give you any indication that he was planning to move out? Not the slightest, no, sir. I don't even have an inkling. I'll call the car here, Joe. Okay. Better get in touch with the crime lab, too. Have him come out. Okay. You mind if I use the phone, Mrs. Holden? Well, not at all. It's right there back in the hall. A little shelf on the wall. Thank you, ma'am. You think Mr. Bartley did? You think he killed the woman? Well, we don't know, ma'am. Did Mr. Bartley rent this room by himself? What? I don't understand. Well, did he register as Mr. and Mrs.? Oh, no, sir. Just plain Raymond Bartley. Do you have any idea who the woman might be? Oh, not the slightest. I never saw her before George screamed and I ran in here. Did you touch anything at all in the room here? No. no I know how policemen work. I've heard all about that. Don't touch anything, department. No, sir, I didn't touch anything. Uh-huh. Out of the way, Joe. Right, Miss Holden, have you ever seen the woman before? No, sir, I haven't. Never saw her before. Just took a quick glance. Terrible, just terrible what they did. Mm-hmm. What if you could give us a description of Mr. Bartley? Well, that'd be kind of hard. Like I said, I don't pay a lot of attention to the people who live here. I just collect the rent and let it go with that. Once in a while, when George is sick, I come in and clean up. Those times I talk to him a little bit, but I, I'm not the nosy type. You know what I mean. Could you tell us about how tall Bartley is? Well, I have to think about that, too. I guess he's about as tall as you, maybe a little one way or the other. How much would you say weighed? Well, he's kind of a heavy set little man. I, I guess he weighs about as much as my husband. That'd be 200 or so. Mm. How about his coloring? Do you know? Oh, um, there it goes again. I tell you, officers, I can't tell you too good. Mr. Bartley was kind of a crowd melter. I beg your pardon. A crowd melter. You, you know, you put him in a crowd and he just melts away. You never pay any attention to him. You know what I mean. Yes, ma'am. And as I can remember, he had kind of brown hair and, and blue eyes, I guess. Mm, was there anything peculiar about him? Did he have any scars, any marks, anything at all about him that would make you remember him, make him a little easier to... No. No, not a thing. How about the way he talked? Could you tell where he was from? No, he was just kind of an ordinary man, nothing special. When was the last time you saw Mr. Bartley? Oh, let me see now. I think it was... Um, Yes, Monday night. I, he was coming in. I was just coming back from the grocery. It was about, uh, oh, 6, 6.15. I said hello, and then he said the same hello. And then he went on upstairs, and I went to my apartment. That was the last time. Did Mr. Bartley have any close friends in the building, you know? Of? No, not that I can think of. Well, did he ever say where he worked or what he did for a living? No, not that I remember. Well, how about references? Did he have any? No, I didn't ask for any. You know if he drove a car? <laughs> it seems so stupid. Seems like I don't know the answers to any of your questions. I don't know about if he drove a car or not. We don't have any garages in the building. He might have, and I wouldn't know it. I just didn't pay any attention. You know what I mean. Well, did he get any mail while he was here? Would you know that? No, sir, nothing. All right, we'd like to talk to Georgia if we could. Sure, I'll ask her to come up here. Poor thing's so upset. 
terrible. It's the first time anything like this has happened to me. The first time anything like this has happened in a place. I don't understand it. I never bothered the tanks, never caused them any trouble. I don't even know this Bartley. Why do you have to do a thing like this to me? Why me? Well, I don't know, ma'am. Why her? The crime lab crew got there and went over the apartment. Photographs were taken of the room and of the position of the body. In going over the room, the crime lab came up with a probable murder weapon, a cast iron poker standing in the fireplace rack. Brown hair, similar to the victim's, was found clinging to the metal. Gene Bergman lifted several partial and some full fingerprints from around the apartment and from the poker itself. He compared them with fingerprints of the maid and eliminated her as a suspect. He rolled the prints of the dead woman. Hers were eliminated from those found in the apartment. We talked to the maid and got the same story that we'd been given by Mrs. Halden. She was unable to add any information to what we already had. We talked to the neighbors in the building. None of them had had any dealings with a missing Ray Bartley. The woman in the apartment next to his told us that on the previous night at about 10.45, she'd heard a woman's voice and a loud argument coming from the murder apartment, but she said she hadn't paid any attention to it. 2.42 p.m., Frank and I checked back into the office. I'll call Bergman, see if he was able to identify the woman and make the other prints. Yeah, right. I hope he's done some good. Yeah. Dean Bergman, please. Hi, Dean. Frank Smith. Have yeah, you been able to make those prints yet? Uh. Well, how about the ones in the poker? Yeah. Well, that's the way it goes, huh? Uh-huh. Right. Nothing on these of the women's are the ones he lifted from the poker. Well, that helps, doesn't it? He sent them both on to Washington, see if they had anything. Yeah. Anything on him in R&I? Well, I called down there. They're checking him now. I can't understand it. What's that? Well, you can rent an apartment to somebody and not know what he looks like. Like she said, the manager's probably minds her own business. Yeah, well, I get it. Homicide Friday. Oh, yeah, wait. Mm-hmm. Now, how about laundry mine? Uh, now, how about the poker? Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, well, that figure's done it. Yeah. Okay, Lee, thanks a lot. Anything? Well, he's pretty sure the poker was a murder weapon. Anything to identify the woman? No, not a thing. Never did. This sure knew what he was doing. Removed everything that could possibly tell us who she was. That puts us in a good position. Yeah. An unidentified body and an unknown killer. The report came back from R&I. There was nothing in the records on a Ray Bartley of that description. Three other teams of men were assigned to assist in the investigation. We talked with everybody in the neighborhood around the apartment building. None of the storekeepers had noticed the missing man. None of them could give us any further information. An APB was gotten out carrying the name and description that we'd obtained. An APB was also gotten out on the dead woman. We checked with missing persons detail for a possible missing report on the victim. They said they'd let us know. The newspapers gave us their help, and in the following editions, they carried pictures of the woman and requested that anyone knowing her identity should contact the police department immediately. Two days passed. During this time, several people came in and said that they were sure that they knew the dead woman, but they were unable to identify her. Other leads were checked out, but let us know where. The manager and the maid came in and went through the mud book. No result. Monday, April 21st, 9.27 a.m. Righty? Yeah. Oh, hi, John. Hi, Frank. Hi, darling. You guys getting anywhere in this closet murder? No, not a thing. Well, I got a hunch. Maybe it won't go anywhere, but I thought you guys might want to check it out. What's that? We got a missing report from San Francisco a couple of weeks ago. man up there said that his wife had come down here to see her sister. Said she never showed up. Yeah. We went out and talked to the sister... Time she wasn't too cooperative. You know, like like uh, she knew where her sister was all the time. I checked this description in the APB. Seems to me to match the description we got from both the husband and the sister. Oh. Well, like I said, it's just a hunch, but I thought you might talk to this woman. Might be able to come up with something. What's her name? Let's see. Um, Allard, Mara Allard. Lives out in Hollywood Boulevard. You talk to her. See if you don't come up with the same thing we did. Yeah, what's that? She doesn't care if her sister's dead or alive. <laughs> I drove out to see Mrs. Myra Allard. She told us that her sister had written and said that she'd be down for a visit. On the day that she was supposed to arrive, the sister had phoned and told Mrs. Allard that she wouldn't be out that day, but that she'd met some friends on the train, that they were all going out on a sightseeing tour of the city. In talking to her, we got the same impression that she'd given John St. John of missing persons detail. We asked her if she'd go with us to see if the dead woman might be her sister. At first, she appeared reluctant, but when we gave her a full description of the body, she agreed to accompany us. She looked at the dead woman and burst into tears. 
Half an hour later, after she recovered from the shock, we talked to her in the interrogation room at the city hall. Dallas, no doubt about it. It's terrible. My own sister's dead. Oh, you try to take it easy. Would you like another glass of water, Miss Allen? No, thank you. Not just finding you dead. I guess I always knew that Alice would end up like this. I wanted it this way, but I always knew it in my heart. How's that, man? You don't understand that. You'd have to know Alice. She's a beautiful girl, wonderful person. Mm-hmm. Well, you said that you heard from Alice when she got here in L.A., is that right? Yes, that's right. She called right after she got off the train. What did she say to you then? Well, as I told you, she said she met some friends on the train and they were going to like to see the town. Uh, did she say who these friends were? No, just said that they were going to pick up rain and go out in the town. Right? Yes, very likely. She tried to call him when Alice didn't show up, but there wasn't any answer to the apartment. Where does he live, ma'am? Out in Hollywood. I, I think it's on the film or someplace. I have his address. Mm-hmm. Who is this Fletcher? Well, that's something I'm not very proud of. Well, why is that, ma'am? He's a friend of my husband. Well, not, not really a friend in the real sense of the word, sort of, sort of an acquaintance. Well, why do you say that you're not very proud of it? I feel that it's all my fault. Well, I still don't think I understand, ma'am. The divorce. Oh, Alice and Tom were on the verge of separating. Tom said that he'd come at just about the end of the line. Alice told me they used to have terrible fights. And when she was down here one time, you see, I, I think it was about, about three months ago, terribly depressed, said that she and Tom had been fighting for several weeks. A couple of times, he'd hit her. Can't understand it. I really can't. I told Alice I didn't believe it. She showed me the bruises all across her back and shoulders. She said that one night they were going over the bills, and Tom just seemed to go crazy. Started to rant and rave about how much they were in debt. Of course, I knew why. I told Alice so. I said it was her fault for driving him, always asking for something new, something else. Uh-huh. She said that she told Tony that if he couldn't afford to keep it the way she wanted to live, the thing she'd just have to find somebody who could. That's when he hit her. She left that night to come down here. But that was terrible. I don't agree with her, but I don't think any man has the right to hit a woman. Yes, ma'am. Well, she moped around the house for a couple of days. Said about how she was never going back to him. I felt kind of sorry for her. Even though I don't agree with her. After all, she was my sister. Yes, ma'am, we understand. Well, that night my husband came home, and he brought this Ray Fletcher with him. Met him down at the office. Ray, what did you say, madam? Down at the office. Ray works for the same company. He's a steward on the ship that travels up the coast from here to Washington. Anyway, my husband brought him home for dinner. Ray said that we should all go out to eat, so we did. Had dinner and a few drinks, and and Ray brought us home, and then Alice went on. Alice didn't get into almost 3.30 in the morning. I see. That night, Ray was here again. You know, it's went out that night and for the next four nights in a row. Every night out until all hours. Mm-hmm. I finally had a talk with her about it. I told her I didn't think Tom would like it. And that I wouldn't ever do things like that while she was under my roof. That's when she told me that she was going to divorce Tom. That she and Ray were going to get married. Uh-huh. I told her I thought she was crazy. She didn't know what she was doing, but there wasn't any talking to her. She saw Ray every day. Then she went back up north to get them straightened out. I see. Well, did she follow through with her divorce plan? Well, as far as I know, she did. She wrote me and said that she talked to Tom about it and that they'd reached an agreement that he'd let her have her freedom. Well, how did he seem to take all this? Well, he called me one night and asked if I knew why Alice was leaving me. He didn't know about Ray. I told him all about it before. I thought that maybe Alice hadn't said anything about it. What was his reaction to it? I almost went crazy on the phone. Tom's a real jealous man. He could have gotten through the phone wires. I think he'd have taken my head off. He screamed that I'd influenced his wife, that it was all my fault. Well, why didn't you tell the officers from missing persons all of this when they were out there, ma'am? I didn't want my husband to know about it. Then, too, I thought that it might be better if Tom didn't know where Alice was. But what he said, I thought it would be better if he never saw her again. What's that, ma'am? That night, we had the argument on the phone. He said that she'd never leave him. Mm-hmm. He'd see her dead first. <laughs> The description of Ray Fletcher Mrs. Allard had given us tallied closely with that of Raymond Bartley. She also gave us his address and phone number. It was an apartment house in the southwest section of the city. Frank and I drove over but found that he'd moved and left no forwarding address. We checked the apartment, but it had since been cleaned and occupied. Again, we ran into the same problem. No one could give us any information as to his whereabouts. We went back to the city hall and ran the name Ray Fletcher through R&I. There was no record on anyone answering his description. We contacted the shipping line where he was employed, and they told us that they'd pull his employment record out of the files and call us back. We contacted the San Francisco Police Department, gave them the full details of the case, 
and had them check on the movements of the victim's husband, Tom Hudson, as a possible suspect. 4.52 p.m. Frank and I checked back into the city hall. Hudson sure got a movie. Yeah. Well, we'll know more when we hear from the San Francisco department. Huh? Here we go. I'll check the book. Right. Anything? Yeah, there's a message from the shipping company Fletcher works for. Want us to give him a call? Okay, what's the number? You got it there? Yeah. Hollywood 26709. Okay, I'll call it. Hollywood 
blockade of the dock area was set up immediately in the event Fletcher had escaped from the ship. All officers in the area began a search. The search of the ship was started. A check of Fletcher's cabin turned up several letters from Alice Hudson. In the letters, she told Fletcher that she was going back to her husband. We talked to the members of the crew who had been in the vicinity of the brig. From one of them, we found that Fletcher had been in custody as the ship entered the harbor. On the floor of the brig, we found a small strip of metal that Fletcher had used to pick the lock of the door. The search of the ship went on. 11.47 a.m. One of the seamen found Fletcher's coat on the forward part of the deck. It had been wedged in behind a lifeboat shot. The search of the dock netted us nothing. All we could assume was that Fletcher had escaped from the brig, jumped overboard, and then tried to swim to shore. Inspector Sutton got in touch with Captain Cornelius Murphy, skipper of police boat D.A. White. Captain Murphy and his crew began a search of the bay from the dock area to Land's End. All police officers in the bay area were notified of the escape. Captain Jackson furnished us with a good snapshot of Fletcher. Seven hours passed. The search continued. Apparently, Fletcher had made good his escape. Wednesday morning, April 23rd, we got a report from an officer in the search party that the body of a man answering Fletcher's description had been found out near Steel Rocks near the Golden Gate. Sutton, Zimmerman, Frank, and I drove out to Land's End. We got out of the car and walked the rest of the way. Watch your step, Frank. Yeah. Every time one of those waves breaks, it makes its legs like glass. Sutton? Yeah, Joe. You see anything yet? No. Wait a minute. I'll see if I can yell to Zimmerman. He can see it from there. Maybe he can tell us if we're getting close. Yeah. Zimmerman? How are we doing? You hear what he's saying? Ah, wind's carrying his voice away. He's waving his arm, pointing down below us. Now, wait a minute. Watch it, Joe. It's a long way down. Yeah, you don't have to tell me. See anything? A little after this next wave break. There he is. You see? Wedged in down here? Yeah. It looks like him. Hard to be sure with all this water, though. Yeah, I'll go down a little further. Take it easy, Joe. Yeah. It'll take a minute. Watch it. I'm all right. How about it? Yeah. It's Fletcher. Well, I'd better get the crew up here and pull him out. Yeah. Carried this far with the current, huh? Yeah, that's right, Joe. They get mean this time of the year. Well, that does it. Huh? Yeah, look that way. What's the matter, Joe? I was just thinking. Yeah? It's a rough way to die, isn't it? Sure is. You'd think he'd have known, wouldn't you, Joe? About those currents out there from Alcatraz to Angel Island. Some of the meanest currents in the world out there. Yeah, I know. You'd think a guy like Fletcher would have known better. Working on a ship, he should have known about that water. Maybe he did. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On April 23rd, an examination was held in the office of the coroner of the city and county of San Francisco. In a moment, the results of that examination. <laughs> completion of the autopsy, the body was identified as Raymond S. Fletcher. The identification was made by his personal effects, fingerprints, and the personal identification of Captain James R. Jackson. Further investigation showed that the suspect had rented the apartment where the body was found, and that he was guilty of the murder of Alice Hudson. His fingerprints were checked and found to be the same as those on the murder weapon. <laughs> cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the Office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, June Whitley, Peter Lee. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann.